Hi, Fabio from Opsworks here, and today we're going to be taking a look at how to productionize feature pipelines with, uh, with Opsworks. As we looked at in previous videos what feature pipelines are, uh, in essence, they are the piece of code that are responsible for um, creating features and registering features with the uh, feature stores, making those features available to the scientists to train models or in production for the models to, to make predictions, right? So productionizing uh, feature pipelines is important because it allows feature, features to be refreshed on a regular basis so new models can be retrained um, and also uh, up refresh the features that are used by production models to make uh, inference um, and make predictions. We have seen in other videos, you know, you can build feature pipelines with a different set of frameworks in Opsworks. You can use, uh, you know, Pandas, you can use Spark, you can use Flink. We have seen how to create feature, external feature pipelines on top of Snowflake tables. Um, and so in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the productionization step um, and how to deploy them in a production setting and make sure that they run and make sure that we monitor them uh, for, for failures and so on. Right, so when, you, uh, when we talk about feature pipelines and productionizing feature pipelines, we actually talk about like three different things, right? So the first aspect is uh, managing the code base, right? So where is the, where is the code that actually generate the features? Second one is, okay, where do we deploy it? Where do we run the pipeline? How do we schedule the pipeline? And the third aspect is uh, how do we monitor the pipelines that is actually running correctly? Right? For the first part, uh, how do we manage the code base? Um, Opsworks are relying on existing tools that you are probably already have running um, to, to manage the code base. That would be uh, GitHub, would be GitLab, would be Bucket. So these are three uh, most popular uh, code hosting sites. And you can integrate Opsworks with different tools and you can basically um, configure Opsworks to pull um, a repository and pull code into Opsworks to be able to execute it, right? So I can quickly show an example. I've already created, set up my, my API keys and everything for, for GitHub. We're gonna go in details about these steps in a different videos and how to automate the process in, in a different videos. Or you can go ahead and we left a link in the description down below to read that blog post um, that, that explains the similar concepts. Um, for this specific example, we have already created, um, uh, like we have already cloned a repository, which contains all my feature pipelines for the fraud project, right? Um, so that's already available, and I can already create jobs, uh, create, already create like execute pipelines out of out of that code base. Um, the second aspect is how to execute the pipelines and how to run those pipelines, right? So in Opsworks, um, we are flexible. You can run those feature pipelines within Opsworks. So Opsworks provides the compute environment to be able to run Spark, Flink, and Python um, uh, feature pipelines. Or um, you can already like, leverage your existing infrastructure that you might have around. Like for instance, you might have a Databricks environment where you can run Spark, and Spark jobs. You might have like model if you wanna run uh, Python applications and so on and so forth. So depending a little bit on um, your existing infrastructure, what you prefer, uh, Opsworks is flexible in that environment. Uh, in, this, in this specific video, we're going to be looking at how to run things within the Opsworks environment, so how to schedule jobs in Opsworks and how to monitor jobs in Opsworks. But the same concept can be applied if you're running outside, essentially. So to be able to, to, to create a job and schedule a job, um, we have a UI for it. We also have some APIs for it so that you can also like, automate these steps um, and you can do that programmatically. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be showing you through, through the UI right now. So, um, I can go in my jobs uh, uh, page, I can create a new job for instance. So I need to select the code I wanna run. So in this case, I'm gonna go into my uh, clone GitHub repository and I'm gonna go into my fraud profile, features, profiles, and select the, 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 the Python script I wanna run. Um, I can define an um, important aspect, I can define the schedule, right? So uh, here there are different uh, steps, uh, different configuration you can, you can have, right? So the, the simplest one, would be to say, I'm gonna run this job every, let's say every hour or every day, right? And you can specify the frequency uh, based using these uh, drop down menus. For instance, I wanna say, I'm gonna refresh my user profiles every, every day at um, like at one in the morning, right? So, sorry, at, at midnight. Um, so I can use this, I can use the, the drop down menus to do that. Um, if you're familiar with cron based expression, you can also select that, you can also use Chrome based expression and they like give you a little bit more freedom in terms of like scheduling capabilities. The other important thing you want to set is the start time and the end time, right? So in this case, I want to create a job that's going to run from now on in the future. 
Uh, but oftentimes when I'm building models, I need also the historical data, right? So what you can do with, uh, with Opsox and the scheduler here, you can also set time, like the start time in the past. Um, what that allows you to do essentially allows you to backfill the data with data that, like with features that were generated uh, in, in the past essentially, right? So here you can basically say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna basically say, I'm gonna schedule this starting from, I don't know, May of 2022. Um, and what's gonna happen here is that the scheduler is gonna run this um, at the same cadence, at the same frequency that you specified here, right? So every day. Um, obviously it's not gonna, it's gonna not let one day pass between execution, it's gonna run them serially, um, but it's gonna run them and the, the execution will represent every day since uh, the, begin the 1st of May, 2022, until um, now, and obviously because we didn't specify the end time, also it's gonna end up in the future, right? So this is powerful if you're doing backfilling, some like, quick backfilling of the data, you can basically set time in the past, that's a scheduler, uh, schedule enough executions um, in the past, um, and basically um, backfill your, your, feature, your feature group. Uh, you can also set an end time, Let's say you wanna, you wanna backfill only one year of data, like five years ago, you can basically set, okay, start time, let's say six years ago, uh, and then the end time five years ago, um, they would basically um, you know, have, uh, generate one year of history to backfill your, um, your specific data. What's gonna happen when the, job, when the, when the scheduler triggers a job, um, it will actually provide um, an additional parameter to your execution, which is the start time, right? The start time here, doesn't represent the moment the execution actually happened, but it represents the moment uh, of the, the, the moment the execution should have been scheduled, right? So um, this is important if you're doing, again, backfilling and you have executions in the past, this doesn't represent now the when the execution actually executed, but it represented the point in time in the past when the execution um, should have been run essentially, right? So that's useful again. You can configure your job to read up this argument and, and act uh, appropriately. Okay, so we've seen how to create um, a schedule, create a job and, and schedule it through the UI. As I said, there, we also have APIs available so you can automate that step as well. Um, the last step we wanna talk about is uh, uh, monitoring, right? So we wanna make sure that if a pipeline is in production, we get an alert if something goes wrong, right? So there are different types of monitoring you can apply on a feature pipeline, right? So the basic one and the one we're gonna be looking at this, in this video is just making sure that the pipeline runs, right? So if there's a failure in the job itself, the job crashes, maybe it's an auto memory, maybe some permission denied, or anything like this, we get a notification and we get an alert and we can act on it, right? There are different type of errors that can actually happen in the feature pipeline, right? You might actually have bad data, you might actually have null values that you don't want, right? Or um, you might have like distribution changes in the data itself, right? For those type of monitoring, uh, we have support for um, good expectations and we have support for feature monitoring um, to be able to actually get alert if these two th things happen and we're going to be looking at them in a separate videos. So today we're going to be focusing on the most simple example which is basically saying uh, if, there is a, if there is a pipeline failure just like send me an alert, right? Opsos supports three ways of sending alerts either by email, uh, by Slack or uh, send a pager duty notification. This step requires some admin uh, be involvement um, on the Slack side, for instance, this example we're gonna be looking at today is with Slack. On the Slack side, you, you need a Slack admin to generate a webhook for you. And on the Opsox side, you need an Opsox admin to go in the cluster settings, um, go into the alerts configuration and configure um, Slack. I already configure it because the URL, the, the Slack webhook is gonna return you contains the API key and we don't wanna lick it. Um, but this is a pretty simple step, you just copy paste the, the URL in the, in the form and this gives Opsox a way to communicate and send messages to your um, uh, Slack workspace, right? So once the admin has done that, um, we can go ahead in the project settings, right? And we can configure what we call a specific receiver. Here we basically wanna say for a specific, um, for a specific uh, event, right? We wanna say, okay, send the, this notification on Slack on this specific channel or on this, uh, to this specific set of users, essentially, right? So here we basically um, create what we call a receiver, and after that, we can actually call the, uh, we can actually create the uh, notification system, right? We have two ways of defining notifications, right? We can define them um, uh, like globally, uh, in mean, means like uh, for all the jobs in a specific project, for instance. 
you can basically say every time there is a job failure, no matter what the job is, um, send a notification to this specific, uh, to this, through this specific receiver. And we can basically say, okay, this is gonna be severity critical. Um, severity doesn't really matter. It's just a way the uh, message is gonna rep be represented in Slack. And this is basically um, gonna trigger a job, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna trigger a, um, an alert every time a job failure happens, no matter what the job is. Uh, you can also define this on a per job level. So I already created a, uh, like a failure job. This job is meant to, to fail. Um, and you can see here that like on job failure, I'm gonna send a critical alert uh, through my receiver. And if I schedule this one, it's gonna take a couple of seconds to, um, if I run this one, it's gonna take a couple of seconds to run. Um, but I can, I already run them uh, a couple of times in the past. And I can see that if I go on my, on my Slack channel for it, I can see that I received a bunch of different notifications of that the job, that specific job has failed, the project, um, the, the, the job name, the execution, the specific execution ID that failed. Um, and so I can get an alert um, if, the, yeah, if the pipeline is broken, essentially, right? As I said, this is a quite simple way of monitoring. We have more complex ways of monitoring both data, data quality and also data distribution. And we're gonna cover that in a, in a, in a different videos. Um, that's it for, for today. Um, thank you for watching and uh, see you next time.